The mystical part of Torah, the Kabbalah, you all know, was um, kept secret, reserved, uh, we're not allowed to study it until you're 40 years old, and a scholar in all the other parts of Torah, and, in the, and even then, you had to have a special, sensitive soul, and then you were permitted to study Kabbalah just one-on-one, -on -one, never in the classroom or in public. This changed about 400 years ago. The Ari in Tzvat declared that the time had come to make this wisdom available. Now it's available. Very available. Anyone who wants can study Kabbalah and is studying Kabbalah. And now that we're studying it, the mystery is, why was it kept secret? There's nothing dangerous in it. What's the secret? The secret is not something dangerous. Secret means private, personal, intimate. That's secret. From the Torah we know what God wants. But we have no idea what it means to him. He tells us what to do. Thou shalt not, or thou shalt. What's in it for him? How does it matter to him? How much does it matter to him? This we see only in the Kabbalah. In other words, like in any relationship, for the first thousand years, we got to know the facts. The things that were not intensely personal. Because that comes later. But at this stage in history, like 400 years ago, the relationship between us and God had developed to where we can handle a little more personal insight. We can get a little more intimate. Like, how do you get to know your mother? Takes a long time. And it's not until you're grown up and your mother is getting old, then she starts to reveal a little bit of her truest, deepest feelings and so on. So the Kabbalah really is an insight into God that was not available before because there was the danger that we would humanize it and trivialize it. That's why your mother doesn't show who she really is. Because <laughs> she's afraid you're going to dismiss it as insignificant and that's going to hurt a lot. The other reason is, as long as God never really showed himself and his personal investment in our relationship, then if we sin, it's forgivable. Oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I, like every kid says to the parent, I didn't know it was so serious. I didn't know you really cared. But what if we know everything? And our parents bear their souls and we know everything. And we still sin against them. Then it's much harder to forgive. Mm. So God left that information for the end of history so that we could be forgiven for our mistakes. Now that we know, the forgiveness is no longer necessary. We have gained forgiveness by our painful, long, miserable history. Mm. Now we deserve only reward, so why not? Why not reveal the secrets? The ultimate secret, I think we'll get to talk about this. The ultimate secret is the statement in the Zohar, God, Torah, and Jews are all one. We're not related, we're one, inseparable. There was never God without Torah, there is no Torah without God, there's no God without the Jewish souls because we're a piece of him, there's no soul without God, it's all one. So 
Judaism takes on a whole new meaning. The mitzvah is not to get you closer to him. You're one with him. So now, why do we need the mitzvahs? That is a whole new, it's a whole new light. This is um, a very, that's a more difficult topic for me, the mitzvahs, because what I have learned is that we exist, we come back into the world because we haven't completed our learning and there are I'm going to get a little little complicated here but feel free to stop me and re you know reroute me if if it's getting too complicated from what i understand the human soul is made of 613 parts which then correspond to the 613 mitzvot and and then it gets even more complicated from there but i won't i won't get to that and so when we are reborn into this world and we are meant to really evolve ourselves it is through the learning of actually moving through doing the 613 mitzvot to the best of our ability that we then evolve to our next incarnation otherwise we're kind of stuck in this cycle of birth and death that doesn't necessarily take us anywhere. And one of the things that's a little bit more difficult for me um, as somebody who's a psychologist to support the way that I support most of the other Torah concepts with science and psychology is some of the more um, difficult to reach mitzvot that may not apply as much to modern times and how that corresponds with the evolution of the human soul. Can you speak to that a little bit? Keep me wet. That's okay. We have to we have to add one more one more uh, ingredient here. Evolving into what we're supposed to be does not move us further from God, but closer to God. In other words, evolving to the maximum that a human can be means dissolving into God, not becoming more human. The way to do that, of course, is through divine, not human, activity. Mm. So the mitzvot, they're all divine activity, not human. So the objective, like, uh, like uh, the difference between pop psychology and real psychology, the healing doesn't come by becoming more me. It comes by becoming less me. But if less me, then where am I going? I don't want to dissolve into nothingness. Less me means more him. Mm. Isn't that a good description of a marriage? Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's an amazing description because one of the things that I personally have struggled with in my journey is that when you're raised in this city, I was raised in this city since I was seven. I was an immigrant and moved here during the Iranian revolution and was here since I was seven. There was no access to what I would call true Orthodox Judaism or what we had in Iran, which was basically Orthodoxy, but in a conservative fashion, so to speak. But the, the core of the Judaism that was taught was true. It, it aligned with orthodoxy. Here, um, we had con a conservative temple that's one of the biggest conservative temples in America. And that was where most Persian Jews flocked. And what was taught at that temple was that Torah is 
not applicable to all the ages. It is, there are certain aspects of Torah that are not applicable to modern times, which from what I understand is absolutely untrue. Um, so what, what I did on my path was move towards um, Buddhist teachings because Buddhist teachings to me felt like little sort of tangents of what Kabbalah taught, the little bit that I could understand as a young person. And the difference, what I found once I hit 40 <laughs> and not before that, was that the difference between Buddhism, which seeks ego relinquishment to the point of no, no me, no, no non-existence, is different than Jewish belief in ego relinquishment, where there is, there is a me, but that me becomes one with a higher being. So you are consistently in service mode of Hashem in the way that it is actually dictated, but you are not losing yourself. And one example of that for me was that when I would, you know, there's, there's been moments in my life where I've achieved or, or done a great healing or, or helped in someone achieving something good in their life. And they would say, aren't you so proud of yourself? Wow, you did this, you did this. And I would just sit there and say, this is all Hashem. This is all Hashem. And there would be zero sense of self in that. But once I really understood the differentiation between what I had learned for the first 25 years and what I've learned since then in the next 25 years was that there's a little sense of self, but even that self comes from the self that matters comes from Hashem, but it is a self. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about this idea of ego relinquishment in the Jewish way from you. Well, to, to put it in, in practical terms, it is so much easier to admit that I am wrong than to admit that you are right. Is that not true? Mm. It, there's no comparison. People who are perfectly comfortable and able to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I made a mistake, I was wrong, I'm so stupid. Mm. They can do that. Mm. And it doesn't hurt their ego. But to admit that somebody else is right, they can't. Mm. Wow. Their ego will wow. not allow it. The self-effacement in Buddhism is I am nothing, I am wrong, my needs, my wants are nothing. Why? Because I'm nothing. So I'm wrong. And who's right? Nobody. Mm. Mm. The universe, or whatever right, that means. Right, right, whatever that means, exactly. So there is no you're right in Buddhism. There's mm. I'm wrong. Mm. Wow. Fascinating thing is that most of Buddhism and Hinduism, the whole Eastern philosophy, came from Avraham. Oh. Avraham, after Sarah passed away, married Keturah, right? And they had children. And Avraham gave them, the children of Keturah, he gave them a gift and sent them to the east. Mm. They moved to the east. Mm. The original philosophy in the east was called Brahman or Ibrahim, or Abraham. Wow. So wow. What, wow. what Avraham gave his children is his philosophy before God spoke to him. Hmm. For 75 years, Avraham was an incredible philosopher, believed in God, taught the belief in God, sacrificed his life for the belief of hmm. God, but he had never heard from God. So it was all, I'm wrong. I'm not it. I'm not the answer. Wow. I am not the end. But what is? Don't know. When God came and said, I need. You're right. It's not your need. It's my need. 
He said, okay, you guys take the philosophy and go to China. <laughs> yeah, wow. And we are going to continue the study of what God needs, and that will be Judaism. Hmm. So the humility that we're talking about is not I'm nothing. I'm here for him. Hmm. And this is really even the Orthodox world, even some people who study Kabbalah, miss the point. Mm. They're afraid of it, actually. Mm. The entire point of Judaism is, you think you need? Your needs are petty compared to God's need. Mm. And that's why we are very willing to serve Him and do what He needs, because His need is awesome. My need is sometimes embarrassing. Mm. Isn't the beauty of that in, the, in serving a higher force and our Creator, we are actually actualizing our own potential. It is through that journey of serving our higher yes. Creator. That's our highest potential, that we can mm. be there for Him. Mm. There's nothing higher. Here's a really beautiful thought. What's one of the unique things about a, about a human being that separates us from the animal, the vegetable, and the mineral? Listen to this. The nature of a human being, not religion, nature. The nature of a human being is that he is never content being human. The animal is content to be an animal, just don't interfere. The vegetable is content to be a vegetable, just don't interfere, don't step on me. And the mineral is perfectly happy to be a mineral, just don't crush me. The human being does not find contentment in being human. Hmm. In other words, I have to become something more than I was created to be. But what is more? So in some desperate ways, human beings try to become animals because I'm not content being human. Mm. So I want to run like a deer in Olympic uh, com competition. I want to fly through the air like a bird. I want to swim like a fish. We can't quite catch up. <laughs> the deer is still faster and the eagle is still, you know. Wow. So that's not the direction to go in. What do we do to be something other than human? That's, those are the mitzvot. Mm. Rabbi, one question is, and one of my, my greatest frustrations, is that most Jews are naturally sort of divorced from the soul realm. And I believe that that's one of the most quintessential reasons for their any kind of um, psychological, physical, or spiritual distress that they're in. And when you look at most, like outside of Hasidism, most synagogues, the only thing that most Jews are exposed to is the Sidur. And then when there is a, outside of Hasidism, and the Sidur is from, again, what I understand, primarily code. So there's a lot of what Jews get is, is you know, if you don't do this, God's gonna get angry at you. If you don't do that, he's gonna be mad at you. You know, things that I don't associate with Judaism at all, that I, I feel God is all love and the only reason that you would be punished is not because God is punishing you, but because you are doing things of eras, sins, that are distancing you from God, so he can't protect you in that moment. And so why is it that there isn't a greater um, drive from Jewish leaders to connect Jews 
with their soul because that's where healing lies. And, and that's where disease emanates from, in my opinion, as a psychologist. It's when you are really incapable of connecting with your own soul's purpose, your own soul's drive, your own soul's brilliance, that you are moving towards any kind of disease, psychological or otherwise. So, so professionally, why are children, adult children, terrified of hearing their parents' needs? Why is that so terrifying? Why would they lose respect if they hear that their parents need them more than they need their parents? Why is that scary? People are terrified of the idea that God needs me more than I need him, which is the absolute truth. Because I didn't create him. He created me. Well, then obviously he's the one with the need. It's just so obvious, but scary. So most people who don't study Hasidut, they're terrified. They hear this idea, they run away. Literally, they shut down. Hmm. So I got to this little incident. I get a phone call from a father in Israel. I, have, I have not, don't know him, he doesn't know me. He has a problem. His 12-year-old daughter got it into her head that God was angry at her, and she's all distressed. Wow. They went for therapy, they went to rabbis, they even went to Kabbalah for uh, mystical healing. Nothing helps. Mm. And then he did something that is really distasteful, but he says, here, talk to her, and he puts her on the line. Mm. Oh. So I said to her, God is angry at you? She says, yeah. I said, I'm so jealous. Wow. She said, what? What an answer. I said, you're 12 years old and you can get God angry? How did you become so important? Mm. Wow. <laughs> Problem went away. Wow. Now she goes telling her friends, God's angry at me. Not you. You're not important. <laughs> mm. When God gets angry at us, we don't have to explain it away. Yeah, he's angry. Why is he angry? Because he cares. How does he not get angry? And how are we supposed to respond? <laughs> wow, I didn't think I was so important. And that's why when we read in the Torah that God gets angry at us, nobody faints. <laughs> nobody, nobody walks out traumatized. In fact, there's that portion in the Torah where God describes the horrible punishments he's going to bring on us. You know, yeah. Like four pages worth. Yeah. You're going to suffer, you're going to die, you're going to go crazy, you're going to be crushed. You're gonna... Whoa, whoa. It's like, it literally sounds like a holocaust. We read this in the Torah. And what do we do right afterwards? You go into the social hall and you make kiddush and you have a kichol and you go home. Like, nobody sits there trembling. Hmm. Why? It's your father talking. Wow. So his anger is a compliment, not a threat. Hmm. So here's, here's what we need to do to get to the finish line. God is not a perfectly indifferent creature who has no feelings, no needs, no reactions except anger. Hmm. What a distorted picture of him. Truly. <laughs> He's Truly. a one-trick pony. Yeah. The only thing he knows how to do is get angry. angry. It's, it's a ridiculous... Everything that we have comes from him. Right? We're created in his image. So if I have anger, he has divine, infinite anger. Not no anger. Mm -hmm. 
If I have a little bit of knowledge, he knows everything. Infinite knowledge. If I have a need, it's just a tiny example of his infinite true need. So much so, when a person says, I need, you got to be careful. You're playing God. God created the world with a plan. You mess up his plan, he gets angry. I didn't create the world and I have no plan. Why am I getting angry? So to get angry is to act like God. To say, I need, is to act like God. To say, I know everything, is to act like God. And yet, what you're taught in every school, in every shul, in every synagogue, in every Hebrew class, you need God desperately. He needs nothing. Well, this is, this is a bad relationship. Mm. But like an abused wife. <laughs> We're needy, and we keep begging, and we keep pleading, and he just punishes away <laughs> like there's no end. That's an abusive relationship. Right. To think that God can get angry at us is a huge compliment. We love it. Mm. We're being noticed. We count. We, we mean something. There was an incredible, incredible um, analogy that my teacher, Rabbi Tatz, taught me once. He said, a car cannot function. A car is one of the most practical, important things in the world. It gets you to where you need to go. It gets you to the place where you can do your mitzvahs. It cannot function without a carburetor. And you, each individual in the world, is like that tiny, tiny little nail in the carburetor for which if you didn't exist or if it would fall out, the carburetor wouldn't work. It's super tiny, you can't even see it. But it's the thing that makes the entire thing function. So it's kind of part of what you're saying in that we're very little, we may be, you know, one, speckle of sand in an ocean of sand but each one of us are seen and each one of us matter and each one of us have a, has our purpose and there's another very powerful word what is your purpose how do you know there's a purpose who says there's a purpose eat drink and be merry and then die who says there's a purpose and yet everyone throughout history forever has been looking for the purpose. There's no purpose. Relax. <laughs> Why are we so convinced? Hmm. So I just recently read in the name of Mark Twain. And this, this is something that can, that can serve you for the rest of your life. He said, there are two very important days in your life the day you're born and the day you find out why <laughs> Isn't that amazing it is it is it's everything in one little sentence it is well almost everything <laughs> because if you meet him and you say you know i heard you say that uh, the second in significant day in your life is when you figure out why you were born why were you born he doesn't know Mm. I love that. I love that. Everybody asks the good question. Nobody has an answer. Mm. I was talking to a minister, Christian minister. We were doing a we were doing a documentary, and he was one of the advisors. So I was introduced to him. The first words out of his mouth, noticing that I was Jewish. <laughs> Something gave me away. <laughs> Noticing that I was Jewish, the first words out of his mouth were, so do you believe in the Savior? <laughs> not, not belligerent, not just matter of fact. So I also, I answered him in the same way. I said, you know, really, 
I'm not looking for a God who's going to save me. I'm looking for a God that I can serve, hmm. not a God that will serve me. Hmm. This guy is in his 60s. He started to cry. Wow. He says, I never thought of that. So if you were to ask Christianity, any branch of Christianity, why are we here? There's no answer. You're here and you're in trouble. He will save you and, and protect you from hell and get you into heaven. Yeah, but why are we here? Don't know. That's a really interesting concept because one of my... I, I consider it one of my most important teachings from a psychological standpoint is um, the drama triangle. I didn't create it, but I teach it. And the drama triangle is where most humans come into this world from a conception or perception that every relationship in the world they have is made of a hero or savior, a villain or predator, and a victim. And so when they are born into the world, for most families, the dad is generally the predator or villain, the mom is usually the savior, most families. And they're usually the victim that's being saved. And so they repeat and project this unconscious diagram, this unconscious triangle onto most of the relationships in their life. And I believe that this comes from primarily Christian, living in a Christian country, living in a Christian world, and this idea of Christianity where, you know, someone died for your sins, and therefore you're, you're born a sinner, and your entire life is meant to sort of make up for that. Um, just, just like when we spoke earlier um, in our promotional video, we talked about how possibly this separation between church and state has moved into the psychology of most people and separated them from their own spiritual existence. I wonder if that's also something that has colored Jewish thought in regards to themselves. They've adopted this because this idea of victimhood is a very difficult thing to move most of my clients out of. Even Judaism, without the Kabbalah part, makes you the victim. Mm. And that's very sad. Mm. Because it's not supposed to be that way. Wow. In fact, it's also very fascinating. The fairy tales, the classical fairy tales. Bruno, that line? Completely, yes. The, the uses of enchantment? Yes. He doesn't say the father is the, is the predator. It's the evil stepmother right. or the fairy godmother. Right. Th those are the... Yes. And who is the hero? The simpleton. Mm -hmm. Not the smart, not, not the, the big shots, not the, the simple country bumpkin. Right. And how does he become a hero? He serves a higher authority, mm. the king. He saves the princess right. for the king. Right. And then the king knights him. When the king approves of him, then he has attained his goal. Mm. It's not to become the king. Right. Today, children are raised on superheroes. Terrible. Yes. <laughs> Terrible. Everyone has to be the top. Nobody wants to serve the higher. So. The, 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 the victim mentality that we're born into trouble and we can't help ourselves and we need to be protected and saved and it's so depressing, it's mm. so morbid mm. and so not true. Right. 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 The truth is what God himself says in the Torah, God created the world because it's not good to be alone. Mm. 
<coughs> what a confession. God is saying, I can't be alone. So who's the victim? Mm. Who's needy? <coughs> Except that God being needy is magnificent. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so romantic. It's so humble. Absolutely. You're perfect. You're all powerful. You're the original being. You're everything. And, and you're not enough. Mm. And with me, you're enough. That is so humble. Mm. One of my favorite things in support of what you just said is that I was shocked when I learned that humans, um, our place is even above the angels because we have free will and we were made in the image of God and we have the powers of creation in a way that most, uh, in, the, in the way that angels don't. Angels are a transmission of God's will, but we can actually create an angels with our will. And that's a very, very powerful state for us to hold. It's, it's an amazing state for us to hold. And so when I have been told that our purpose as humans is ultimately tikkun olam, the healing of the world and the healing of ourselves, there's so much more behind that than the idea of just healing our childhood wounds or healing our psychological states. It's, it's like, wow, we're really given God given rights and powers to reach those dispersed sparks, you know, find them, pull them out of darkness and, and basically replicate for ourselves psychologically those parts of ourselves that we thought were not good or shameful or bad and pull those back into the whole and that's what ultimately is considered self-actualization it's the peak of reaching a very powerful psychological healed state and so within the human we are a microcosm of that macrocosm that we are meant to replicate by pulling even internally those sparks that we've kind of put off into the corners, into the shadows, and pulling them into ourselves. So my next question for you, Rabbi, is the same question that put me in a path to go after my doctorate degrees. The question was a simple one. It was, if the Dalai Lama had a wife and kids, would he be the Dalai Lama? <laughs> that's where we we struggle that's where we have that's where we have you know that's the this whole idea of spiritual bypass which i've engaged in where i became incredible at meditating i could go to a monastery and spend 18 hours a day meditating and it was bliss for me yet when i came into the observance of keeping Shabbat and keeping Kashrut, these were more difficult for me than meditating for 18 hours a day. So, because that was a way. And we are the only religion in the world, as I know it, that we need to be mystics in the world. We need to be mystical and still be in the world, impacting it, affecting it, still being married, still having children. Whereas if you're a mystical Christian, you can go be a priest. To me, that's easy. Or a nun, or Buddhist, or any other religion I've studied. We're the only ones that know you are still bound by the laws to procreate, have a wife or husband, have children, and that's when trouble arises. <laughs> That's when the challenges come. Can you speak to that, please? I, I discovered that in a different way. We had this women's program in Minnesota in the 70s. Every intelligent Jewish kid was in India or China or Tibet 
practicing Judaism, practicing Buddhism. Wow. All of a sudden, they start trickling back. And many of them came to our program in Minnesota. Why did they come back? Their guru told them to. Mm. And they said, you see, they're so open-minded, they're not trying to brainwash you. But one of them, who had become literally the right-hand man of the Dalai Lama. Wow. Because she was brilliant. The Dalai Lama told her to go back to her tradition. Why? You see, if you practice Buddhism and you train yourself to meditate, you eventually climb the ladder of, of enlightenment mm. until you reach a level of bliss where everything is just wonderful. Mm. Jews did it in warp speed. Mm. Every Jewish kid got there, got the meditation down, did the whole thing, they were devoted, they, and they get to the highest level of bliss and they're feeling wonderful. And they come to the Dalai Lama and say, okay, what can we do now? He said, no, now, no. That's it? You, no, you don't That's have it. to do anything. You're happy. And they said, yes, so let's do something. He wow. Said, Get out of here. You don't belong here. Wow. You're going to mess up our whole religion. You know? <laughs> Go back to Judaism. <laughs> yeah. Because it's true. If we can reach the state of total bliss, we would become so active and so ambitious that's so funny. Wow. Why? Because if I can relax me, I become so conscious of God and what he needs and what he wants that I will devote myself completely mm. to him. So bliss is not an end. It's a tool. Mm. We should all be blissful so that we can stop worrying about ourselves and do what we were born to do, and that is make God's plan work for Him. Because that ultimately serves us. It doesn't have to. But it does, doesn't it? Yes. It doesn't have to. And that's the next level, right? So if we cannot be thinking about how it serves us, that's the next level. That's, that's the bliss part. That's the bliss part. <laughs> But, but even getting to the point where we are doing to serve is what actually evolves us to the place where we need to evolve to. Because we want desperately to be more than human. Mm. Not the best human. Now, so when, when non-Jews say, you think you're better humans, you're more, you know, you're superior, no. You be human and be happy. We'll never be happy being. So it's a different agenda. It's a different thing. Wow. Wow. What do you think of uh, past lives? Uh, Have you gotten into that? That's my favorite topic. <laughs> that's that's my favorite talk. topic. And it's, 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 it's a little bit... Um, it's a topic that is controversial because one, most people's knowledge of past lives is Brian Weiss's many lives, many masters. And that is not surprisingly, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it, it diverges far from Torah concepts. And the little bit that I have studied has added so much color and meaning to my life that I would love to go there. I would love to go there. So just a few, I'm just gonna put, you know, sort of speak to a few of the things that I know for sure. Um, or, or please correct me if I'm wrong. One of the things I know for sure is that we are the same gender for the most part through every life that we have. If we come back as a different gender, generally there's a glitch in the process of being reborn for a certain specific reason that we need to learn. The second thing that I know is that 
we have we don't have a multitude of hundreds of lives like Buddhists believe and like others believe, but we have maybe a handful, give or take, and that really really adds. Uh, a, a tremendous amount of purpose to each life we're living because when I used to think that we we've had hundreds of lives then for me there was like well what's the point well, let's just live it up this one and then we can come back <laughs> in the next one and we can you know try harder then but then it's it's it adds purpose you you really want to try to get it right this time um, and then there were the different layers of what happens once you move on as a soul that was very interesting to me. Whether it was the, um, what happens, uh, I don't, I don't want to say the terminology because maybe it's a little bit like the beating in the grave, which is kind of the first stages of that. It's like carpet cleaning where you beat the carpet and get all the stuff out. But all of that was very interesting for me too because there was such a rhyme and reason to the evolution of the soul that that too, for me, added meaning to while we're here. So any aspect of that that you'd like to speak to, I'd, I'd love to hear. Yeah, in, in Buddhism, being reincarnated is an automatic process and you have to do something to stop it. Otherwise, you'll just keep coming back. And cycling, you'll come back as a human, you'll come back as an animal, you'll come back as a vegetable, you go through it again and again and again. Right. right. <clears throat> you come back only because you have more to accomplish that you didn't finish in one lifetime, so you're given another chance. There are mitzvahs that only women do, there are mitzvahs that only men do. At least once, every soul has to be a woman. Ooh, really? <gasps> wow. That I didn't know, Rabbi. So some, somebody asked me, wouldn't you like to be a woman? I said, done that. <laughs> Been there. Wow. Wow. So that way you get to do all 613 mitzvot. Wow. Uh, but you don't just automatically come back. There's a, there's a court in heaven, and the court assesses how much you accomplished, how much you were supposed to accomplish, whether you can accomplish it if you're given another chance, and if yes, then you come back and you finish your job. Wow. So even great holy souls come back, because there's more they can do. So it's not a punishment. Now, ultimately, every body, every physical body that performed mitzvahs, with the soul, of course, deserves 80% of the reward. Because every mitzvah you can think of, it's the body that's doing it. You know, a soul can't eat matzah on Pesach. Hmm. Only the body can do that. Right. A soul can't light Shabbos candles. Hmm. It certainly can't go to the mikvah. Hmm. So it's the body that should get the bulk of the reward. Hmm. And yet we're told that when you die, your soul goes to heaven and it gets rewarded. And your body? Eh, put it away. You preserve the body because the soul is coming back to that body. Because that body is going to get its reward. Wow. So yes, it decomposes, but that's temporary. So the soul never really loses its affection to its body. And that's why, if you go to Israel, for example, what is what is one of the uh, one of the most favorite and and, and uh, popular sites? Hebron, 
where our ancestors, our matriarchs and patriarchs, are buried. Yeah. You know how long they've been buried? And you go into where their bodies are? Come on. Mm. The bodies are gone. And no, they're not. Wow. And if you want to get to the soul, the soul hangs around its body mm. forever. It will never give up on its body. Wow. So that is called resurrection. So if I have been here three times, I have had three different lives, it means I have three different bodies. I want them all. And they all deserve to be rewarded. Hmm. When will they be rewarded? When after Mashiach comes, all the bodies will get back out of their graves, have their souls back, and then be rewarded appropriately. That's why we are so careful with the body. So what is Chibut HaKever? The beating of the, of the grave? Mm -hmm. The soul grieves every time another part of the body decomposes. Wow. It's not the body that's suffering. Right. But the soul watching the body go, painful. Hmm. It's been done many times when they dug up the body of a very holy person. Hundred years later, no decomposition. No. Wow. But just like a body can decompose, it can also recompose. Hmm. That's called resurrection of the dead. Wow. These bones will live again. So the, the, the conviction that we've always had and never questioned. Life is short, right? How, how often have you heard, life is short, life is fragile. Before you know it, it's gone. Be careful, don't waste time. That's morbid. Life is, and it's not true. Life is forever, death is temporary. Hmm. When the soul leaves the body, it does not change its character. So here's a very important distinction between Judaism and Christianity. Christianity says, if you make it to heaven, you will be an angel. All angels are the same. You've seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> right? You're an angel. Right. You look like every other angel, you feel like every other angel. When your soul leaves the body, it does not change its personality. So if your father was a rigid person with no sense of humor, don't make jokes about him even now. He has no sense of humor. Mm. Wow. If he was a jolly, funny guy, live it up. Mm. Because he's still that way. Right. Which is even more significant. God forbid a child dies, that soul, let's say a six-year-old, that soul is six years old. Forever? Until it comes back. Mm. A six-year-old needs its mother. Mm. If you stop being its mother, it hurts. Mm. So, it's not that you become a generic something, you remain yourself. And part of that is you remain enamored with your body. How does that work when, during the time of Moshiach, when all of your bodies are coming back, how does the soul inhabit multiple bodies? A soul can divide into many parts. The, the, soul, the body in which I succeeded, let's say, in kindness, the kindness of my soul will enter into that mm. body. In the other body, I succeeded in being more disciplined and more focused. Well, then that part of my soul will go into that body. In fact, the part of the, the, part of the soul that succeeded is not reincarnated. It doesn't get born again. 
only the part that is not finished. So if a person was really good and really productive and so on, the, the biggest part of his soul will stay in heaven and the little piece that is not yet finished will come back and have another life. Gotcha. Another crack at it. Are you guys ready for a little bit of mind-bending stuff? Like, can we, is, is this, are you enjoying this? Like, this kind of complicated? We will, we will. But I, I want to ask a question that, like, I, I, I agree with you on everything that you've said in terms of superheroes and stuff, but there's one thing that I feel like some of these movies, I, I feel like they, they display tenets, sometimes tenets of Kabbalah in certain ways that we couldn't possibly wrap our heads around. And the idea of a multiverse when I learned that not your, your whole soul does not reincarnate into your body, the parts that have accomplished their um, tikkun, their completion, stay up there. Occasionally they may come down to help you accomplish other things that you need to accomplish, but your entire soul is not reincarnated into everybody. Is there other, I mean, beyond the idea of our conception of heaven, are there other universes that our souls may be existing in, in other bodies? Or is that totally sci-fi and ridiculous? <laughs> no, it's not. There are four worlds, and there are souls in each of the four worlds. Mm -hmm. They're very different from each other, more and more godly, spiritual. And they each have their their type of body, mm. obviously not a physical body. If it's not a physical body, it can't, it can't serve God. Ah, oh, wow. So the souls that are in heaven now are waiting impatiently to come back. Wow. Because as far as we're concerned, heaven is a very nice place, but it's like a retirement home. And we hate to be retired, mm. maybe for a month, mm. a year, <laughs> not forever. Right. So all the souls in heaven want to come back and serve God, not be served. Mm. In heaven, you are served. Wow. Okay. You want to get into some real Kabbalah? Literally? Yes, please. <laughs> when God creates the world, he creates it in a logical sequence, like a ladder, rung by rung, until, until the, the creation becomes solidified into a physical, finite, grubby, mundane object. That's so that we can follow the steps back. If he created it just with one fell swoop, there's no way to go back. So he creates it like a ladder so that we can climb the ladder. Each of these steps on the ladder is called a sphera, a divine attribute. Mm -hmm. Chesed, Gvura, Teferes, Netzach, Hod, Yisod, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Malchus. They're all focused downward. The Chachma faces the Bina, the Bina faces the Das, the Das faces the Chesed. Everything is in a downward, linear. When it comes to Malchus, the final of the ten attributes, it turns around and faces up. So that it receives everything that came before it, absorbs it all, then turns back and creates the next world. Wow. That's the attribute of royalty. Royalty is literally in the human, in the human, the country empowers an individual. The individual absorbs all of that and then turns around and runs the country. It's an interesting process. Wow. Very interesting. That's how democracy works. Mm. So democracy is much more godly 
because it mimics the way God created the world. So the beauty of it is that when God created Adam, not the first man, the first human, mm. because this Adam was male and female, mm -hmm. literally half male, half like two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. One side was male, the other side was female. Siamese twins. Then we're told God separated them, turned them into two separate people, and immediately told them to get married and become one. They must have wondered. <laughs> we were one. You separate us and then tell us to become one? And also, how... Yeah, you can become one in a marriage. But that's kind of poetic. You're not literally one. Because you can walk away and... Right. So the oneness was much greater before he separated us. And now, yeah, we can achieve a oneness, but it won't be the oneness that we had. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're losing ground. We're, we're getting worse, not better. So here is the romantic side of God and the romantic side of Kabbalah, which is Hasidut. Mm. The difference between the oneness that existed in creation and the oneness that we achieve through marriage. Adam and Eve were one body, inseparable but they'll never see each other because they're back to back. Mm. Wow. So they are in fact inseparable, but not face to face. Why? After se separating us, we will again become one through a good marriage, not as inseparable as before, but face to face. Mm. And that is much better, worth the operation and the recovery right so that we can be one face to face wow in other words god creates and things keep moving down eventually you get to malchus and malchus says wait a minute where am i coming from and turns around face to face mm. so intimacy begins in the last attributes the lowest attributes of each world. Amazing. So Yesod, which is called foundation, the fundamental relationship is male and female. Mm -hmm. It's the only attribute that comes in male and female. But it's back to back. Mm -hmm. They're inseparable. Right. But it's back to back. Wow. The next one, Malchus, turns around to face his creator. Wow. That's the feminine trait. Wow. Amazing. It's amazing. I mean, no human could come up with this stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's really, you know, this is the mind of God, and it's amazing. I'm, I'm, please go ahead, ask your question. You mentioned about, you know, how our parents, when they die, they're going to come back this, the same way they were before, right? So I lost my parents several years ago. I was extremely close to them, right? Um, in an, I always think about them daily basis, daily basis, right? So when they do come back, they're gonna come back the way they left, or they're gonna come, or if they were not healthy, how would they come back? Would it be the same attitude as they were before? If they were funny before, they're gonna come back the same, and how would they come back? First of all, any body, a physical body, if it is born, then it is mortal. It'll die. The resurrection is not birth. 
when the body comes back through resurrection, it will never die again. It's forever. The body will come back exactly in the same shape in which it died, so that you'll recognize it. But then the process of healing will continue until the body is 20 years old. A child who died young, the healing will move it forward until it is 20 years old. Because Adam and Eve were created 20 That's years funny. old. That's the op optimal physical condition. Now, when everybody is 20 years old, that's going to be a party. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm re very much enjoying this discussion. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm learning a lot of things. I just want to know where the biblical source, where in the Jewish Bible, are we getting all these concepts from? Torah is given in many layers, and that's why it's still alive, because every couple of hundred years, we discover another layer that re-excites us and re-inspires us, so that it's fresh and alive and, uh, and, and inspiring. So there is, of course, the written Torah. And there's the oral Torah, Torah Shabbat Peh. The Torah Shabbat Peh is mostly what God told Moshe, but didn't tell him to write it down. So, for example, Moshe comes down off the mountain after 40 days, and he says, men have to wear tefillin. They said, what's that? It doesn't describe it in the Torah. There's no description. So they said, to Moshe, <laughs> what does that mean? And Moshe described it in detail. It has to be made out of leather. It has to be square. It has to be with black paint, black straps. It has to sit on your head, and it has to sit on your arm. He knew it all. Oh. That's the oral Torah. So the oral Torah is God's word but not in written form. So there's the written Torah, there's the oral Torah, and there is the secret Torah. Moshe came down off the mountain and he taught Zohar, but he didn't write it down. So what is the Zohar? What was taught then, but now it was written down. Why wasn't it written down? Huh? Why wasn't it written down? Ah. Why wasn't everything in Torah written down? Well, the practical reason? If everything was on paper, nobody would bother studying it. When I'll need it, I'll look it up. But because it was oral, it had to be remembered, it had to be memorized, so it had to be repeated, and every student had to be a genius. It made it a living not an archive. So it kept the interest alive. There's another interesting thing that we should maybe talk about it. At Mount Sinai, God said, gather the people and they will hear me talking. And the people said, well, why can't we see you? Let us see you. And God said, no. Listen. I think the reason that Judaism is still alive and we're still Jews and we're still practicing Torah is because we didn't see anything. If we had seen God, we, would not, we wouldn't be interested in him anymore. Because seeing kills passion. Contrary. But he tried, didn't he? He tried. And it just dissipated everyone because we couldn't even handle 
We couldn't handle hearing him. Is that is that what dis is that? Oh wow! It wasn't even seeing him. It wasn't. It was, seeing. Oh wow! But the idea that if you see, you become more passionate. Like wow. men are yeah. visual, right? Not passion. Wow. Seeing does not produce passion. It produces excitement. Right. And excitement doesn't last a weekend. Amazing. So God said, if you want me, listen, mm -hmm. hear me. You look at me, this relationship will end in a month. That's to all the men out there. <laughs> and the listen. Who, and the women who buy it. And so... The, the Kabbalah is the Torah. It's the Kabbalah of the Torah. And it wasn't written down until Reb Shimon Bar Yochai got the courage. So it was transferred orally for ages? Yes. So the other parts of the Torah were translated, trans, transmitted by big groups. Big yeshivot, one teacher teaching a hundred students. The Kabbalah was transmitted one to one. Wow. So in a sense, it's better preserved. In a big group, you can you can misunderstand, you can but when it's one on one, carefully chosen, protected. So that's that's where it is spelled out. Once you hear it, now you look back at the written Torah, and it's right there. It's in the written Torah, but you never noticed it. I feel like I can hear what some people are thinking, and I feel like some people who want to sort of say, well, then, you know, it was just rabbis who said whatever they wanted to say, since it was orally transmitted. No human can... And I feel like... That's, I've heard a lot of that. And it wasn't until I went on my own journey of studying Torah with a real um, sort of devoted rabbi for the last 25 years. And simultaneously, everything that I learned for me, because I was raised to with a very rash, rational parents. My parents were very educated and very rational. Everything needed to be proved scientifically. And surprisingly, shockingly, I was able to I was able to find scientific proof to everything that Torah spoke to. I was able to find whether it was quantum physics or psychology or another science, virtually every single Torah concept that I was taught had proof in quantum physics, science, or psychology. So for me, that is where truth was born, the idea of truth, because I was, I was, you know, I went to UC Berkeley, very liberal, <laughs> you know, everybody's truth is their truth, and there was, I was cracked open to believe, okay, you know, everybody's, everybody has their perception, but it wasn't until I understood and truly realized that when I studied shamanism, Peruvian shamans who live in the Amazon, who never left the Amazon, were saying that the same spiritual concepts were true as what existed in the Torah, that to me, that's truth. That's truth. There's, there's, and that happened with every single Torah concept I came across. So. I know my great grandfather would say that everything in the world that exists comes from Torah. And for a long time, I thought that was just, you know, it's like the Greeks say everything comes <laughs> from Greece and everybody else says everything comes from their culture. But so far in my short life, you know, it's been true. But also this romantic part. The further we go in history, the older our relationship with God becomes. Therefore, God can reveal to the sages things that he did not reveal at Mount Sinai. Mm. So the things that we learn later in history are more personal to God, and that's why he whispers it to one person 
not like thundering it from the top of the mountain. Wow. So we're getting more intimate. We're getting so the the rabbinic, the mitzvot de rabbanan, in some way, are more personal than the ones written in the Torah. Mm. So it turns everything upside down. We're not fading out. We're getting deeper. Like for example, if you remember the, the, the Pasuk, at the end of the 40 years in the desert, Moshe says to the people, until today, till today, God did not give you lev, lehovin, aizen, lishmeya, v'ayin, now, 40 years later, you're starting to understand. Mm. That's only 40 years. 400 years? 4,000 years? We're making progress. Wow. So the customs, the minhag, the, the things that we become careful about that are not written in the Torah and your grandfather never heard about is more important in some way than the things we've always had. So I have a very interesting little example of this. I don't know when it started, but it's pretty recent. If you cut open an onion and leave it overnight, you're not allowed to eat. People thought it was a superstition. It was some kind of a mystical something or another. It's not written in the Torah. It's not written... You know what the problem is? An onion, you cut it open and leave it overnight, it absorbs viruses. You don't eat it the next day. In fact, if you have a virus or a bad chest cold, cut open an onion, put it near your bed when you're sleeping, and you'll wake up feeling bad. Because the virus will be in the oven. Nothing mystical, nothing magical, but ahead of its time. I think the main objective in studying Kabbalah is not to be impressed, to translate it down, demystify, don't get mystical. You said, it's not like Buddhists sitting on top of a mountain, stay connected. Yeah. And we find that also in the Torah. Remember, Miriam and, and, and Aaron were, were saying bad things about Moshe, mm -hmm. and Miriam got leprosy. Mm -hmm. What were they saying? What bad thing were they saying about Moshe? When Moshe came down off the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights, he was not intimate with his wife anymore. Mm -hmm. And Miriam was saying, who do you think you are? There are a lot of holy people. They're intimate. You're not supposed to be like that. Wow. Come back down to earth. <laughs> You've landed. Wow. Right. <laughs> the eagle has landed. Mm. You're back to earth. Act like a human being. And she was right. Mm. And God agreed with her. In wow. principle, God said, you're right. But Moshe is an exception. Mm. Don't mess with Moshe. <laughs> wow. Wow. Next question. Fairy. Um, I just wanted to say what a privilege this is to be sitting here and Louder, louder. Louder. Um, first, I just wanted to say what a privilege this is to be sitting here and listening to both of you. Um, second, I wanted to say that I just came from a wedding in, um, in Cabo, in Mexico, and I'm sitting there, and there's, you know, the kupa and the glass, and the, the kiddush cup, and I just had tears in my eyes because it's moments like that where I'm like, only God could have predicted that 4,000 years later, the chatan and the kala will need to get married like this, they will need to start their life like this, and so many years later, even Reformed Jews are still getting married under the tzitzit mm -hmm. with a kiddush cup, and I really, it was, 
the most amazing thing to me in those moments. I'm like, wow. You know, it's like, he knew, he knew, he knew that throughout time, they would need some kind of a framework, whether they were Hasidic, Reform, Conservative, he knew there would need a framework to keep Jewish couples, Jewish children alive. You know, so I just wanted to say it was, we were in Mexico, you know, but it was the same thing. You know, it was the same thing when Mexico, as it is in Los Angeles, as it is in Russia, and you realize the brilliance of the Torah, the brilliance of God, in those moments when you realize couples around the world are getting married under the tzitzit with the same blessings, with the same kiddush cup, breaking the same glass. So I just wanted to say, coming from that experience, you know, it's those moments when I realize how brilliant, you know, it all is. But then yes. now my next question is this. <laughs> so in my personal life, I went through something very difficult a few years ago. Um, and through the experience, and I want to be grateful to Mona who helped me get through it, Dr. Mona who helped me get through it. But I'm in a place now where I struggle a little with trying to understand that experience from the lens that I'm here to serve God. And if this thing that I'm struggling with that I can't have, maybe that doesn't belong in my service to God, you know? so. In my work with Mona, we're really at this point now where it's about you're here to serve God. You're not here to sit here and say, I want this and I want that. And this concept has even come into my attempt to keep Shabbat. Because I try, I'm trying to keep Shabbat and it's very difficult. So we just had this discussion where I told her I'm having a really hard time keeping Shabbat. It feels like I'm crawling out of my skin. And she's like, when you think about Shabbat, Think about serving God, not asking, I want this and I want that. So this concept in, in, in its most profound way is what I'm dealing with now is, wow, I'm, I'm here really to serve God. And all these things I think I need, I think I just don't need. And if I'm really here to serve God, then that actually lifts so much pressure, mental pressure off of what it is I think I need. And rather if I could really serve God, then it would be a completely different experience. You know, so I just kind of, I don't know if that makes sense, but since I'm here tonight, I wanted to ask if you could shed some, I maybe share some wisdom on how to let go of this thing I experienced and really be um, in this place of serving God. You're, you're onto something here something awesome let me let me put it in 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 personal context i'll talk about myself but you'll get the idea i need to eat i need to sleep i need friends and support i need a job i need money i need something to do i need i need i need it just goes on and on and on. It turns out that this is depressing. The fact that I need to eat is depressing. It's called existential angst. I don't want to need to eat. I hate it. It's a handicap. I didn't ask for it. And there's nothing I can do about it. I've tried going without food. For more than an hour <laughs> and I can't I try going without sleep and I can't I came to the conclusion that the need to eat is not mine I don't need to eat I just can't help it I didn't ask for it I didn't do this to myself God created me dependent on food. And I don't know why. Because it's a nasty thing. I actually was talking to a woman who was anorexic. Wow. And she had been to therapy. She was not in danger anymore. But she calls up and she says, I still, I still think eating is disgusting. I said, it is. 
And I said, everything that the Mishnah says about if you, if you eat more, the worms will have more to eat when you die. You know, just like eating is animalistic, it's grubby, it's disgusting. It's a, she says, you're worse than me. I said, I'm just telling you the truth. It's so humiliating. What is it that we eat? The same thing the rabbit eats. In fact, if I don't have a scarecrow, the rabbit is going to take away my food. I'm competing with a rabbit. <laughs> it's humiliating. Why did God do this to me? I don't know. So all I can do is swallow my pride. No pun intended. <laughs> I swallow my pride and I eat something. Our problem was gone. Wow. Mostly because I agreed with her. <laughs> Everybody disagrees and it doesn't help. I don't need to eat. I really don't. In fact, if we didn't eat, we would live forever. Mm. But because we eat, we die. Because no food is completely healthy. I don't need to sleep. I really don't. A human being spend half your life sleeping is crazy. So if I designed myself, I would not need to sleep, and I would not need to eat, and I would not need to drink. So, I need to eat? No. Whoever designed me needs me to eat. I can't claim it as mine. This is the future of psychology. You don't have deep unresolved needs. You need nothing. Knock it off. You need nothing. Well, then what am I doing here? Oh, you are needed. Your eating is needed. It's not your need. So when we get this hang up, but I must have, I must, I need. No, no, no. Even if you can't do without, it's not your need. And the best example for it is, this kid goes off to yeshiva. Teenager. Overseas. He arrives at the yeshiva, and he goes into the dean, who is a deep Hasidic thinker, and he says to the dean, I need to call my mother. Which phone can I use? The dean said to him, I need... And he repeated it a few times. The kid said, yeah, I need to call my mother. The kid, I need... He got the message. And he said to the dean, my mother needs me to call her. Mm. Which phone can I use? And the dean said, good, lesson number one. You've become a mensch. It's not true that a teenage boy needs to call his mother. It's very true that his mother needs him to call. It's not true that I need to eat. It's very true that God needs me to eat. It's not true that I need to be religious. It's not even true that I need to serve God. God needs me to serve him. When I say I need it, it's plagiarism. Why, why, why are you playing God? You don't need it. This is the future of psychology. When a person is depressed or oppressed or, or burdened by whatever it is, you go to the therapist and the therapist will help you realize you don't need it. But that doesn't leave you without a job because you are needed. Torah tells us this for free. God comes down to Mount Sinai and says, I created the world, blame me. It's not your problem, it's my problem. 
and I need you to keep Shabbos. You know why? Because that's what I'm doing on Shabbos. Stay with me. In the six days I create, you create too. On Shabbos I rest. Rest with me. Stay with me. Follow me. Do what I do so that we're on the same page. So who needs? And this is where religion has become its own worst en enemy. You need to be good. I don't need to be good. Oh, you're going to go to hell. Okay, don't threaten me. <laughs> Explain it or, or be quiet. But threatening me, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah? Absolutely. People don't, get, don't react to threats. But, but you're going to die. So what's your point? I'm not going to live life in order not to die. It doesn't make any sense anymore. So tell me what's important. Don't threaten me. It's not going to work. So the religious grandfather says to the kid, you must go to the synagogue. It said, I must? No. Well, but you must keep, keep kosher. I must? No, I don't. And then it just becomes a nasty argument. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I don't. I don't need to go to heaven. I don't need to be good. I don't need to be holy. I don't need to be enlightened. I don't need anything because I didn't ask to be born. Don't tell me I need. It's like taking me out to an expensive restaurant and then telling me to pay the bill. <laughs> this was not my idea. How did I become responsible? See, that's going back to the purpose. Why am I here in the first place? Don't tell me how to get off the world. Tell me how I got on. How did I get into this mess? Did I ask for it? No. Did I sign some contract? No. Did I agree to all these responsibilities? No. So how am I responsible? Oh, because if you don't do it, you'll get punished. This is sick. Rabbi, I feel like at the end of the day, a lot of what I've learned and studied is that everything we're asked to do serves us. Every single kosher concept and mitzvot serves a medical health concept that, you know, that supports it. Um, even the needs in terms of eating, from what I understand, going back to the realm of the soul, there are souls in fruit, there are souls in animals, there are souls in even minerals. And when you say bracha over it and you eat it, it helps that soul get released from that incarnation to the next. So you are deeply and intricately participating in the cycle of life. And with these simple things that you're doing, you are here to elevate every single action that you're participating in. So and you're very eating. If you're eating correctly, you are elevating the world, the fruit, the soul in that fruit. If you are coming together with your husband, which is something that the Torah strongly suggests on Shabbat, you are creating souls, even if they are not souls that being, are being born into the world, they are souls that are being born in other realms. So every action that you do here is supported by a huge sort of cyclical thing that, that supports it in terms of whether it's your health or your own personal evolution. Ultimately, we want to get to the point where what the rabbi is saying, where we are fully in service. We are not seeking our own personal growth. We're not seeking necessarily anything that serves us. We are in a place of healthy, egoless 
you know, place of service that is serving our higher creator. But in the process, the the thing that for me is is so interesting is that in every stance and every step you're taking in service, whether it's washing of your hands in the morning, or whether it is the shalom bayit of keeping peace in the home. Every single one of these things is for your own personal evolution. Even keeping Shabbat is that the ultimate Shabbat state is the eternity of your soul. And every Shabbat is practice for you to discipline your soul, to live in an eternity of Shabbats, because on Shabbat, you're asked not to create. You're asked not to create, which means essentially doing nothing but existing and having relation with your loved ones. That is the eternity of your soul. So if you are creating on Shabbat and not practicing that discipline, can you imagine the, the torture that your soul is going to feel when it moves into a realm, when it can no longer impact anything, which is what happens when you move on? Only those you leave behind, if they have been trained to pray on your behalf, to light candles on your behalf, to pray on your behalf, will they elevate your soul or create, move you out of stagnation? Otherwise, you're, you're there and you're suffering which is what I call a Jewish version of hell, <laughs> right? So everything that you are asked to do, true, Hashem needs it. Of course, everything that the rabbi is saying. But to me, the benevolence of Hashem is that every single one of the actions you're asked to do are not purely in service to relinquish ego, to grow, to become the best that you can be, which they are and to serve your higher creator, but they are the thing that actually moves you through to the completion of learning the things you need to learn. See, that's all after the fact. After the fact that God creates me, gives me all those needs so that I can serve him, he makes sure that in serving him, I will not lose or suffer. But if he doesn't need it, the whole thing disappears. I don't need to be all I can be. I don't need to fulfill my soul. I don't need anything until he puts me here. And then all of a sudden I have needs. <laughs> Good needs, noble needs, but not mine. I don't need. Hmm. That, that's one of the problems with, with Buddhism. I'm talking to this Buddhist guy, and he's telling me the marvels of it, what you can accomplish. And I said, but what if I say, no thanks? He says, yeah. I said, so I can just, if I say, I don't want to be enlightened, is any harm in that? No. If I say I don't want to serve God, any harm in that? Yes, God is devastated. Mm. That's, that's the part that we really need to reclaim. Because we've turned God into a feelingless, mm. uncaring, invulnerable. Mm. Okay, let's, let's, let's get to that word. Mm. What's good about being vulnerable? Mm. Strength. What? How is vulnerability strength? Courage. The co most courageous sense of connection is you cannot connect without vulnerability. Right. But doesn't that make you dependent? Mm. Needy? Weak? Mm. Crippled? No? No. 
his guy calls me. I got to tell you this the whole story. A guy calls me from a little town in Oregon. I never heard of this town. He says, I am a retired psychiatrist. I was born Jewish. I've practiced Christianity for 30 years. I'm living in this town. There are no Jews here. I'm getting older and I feel a need to connect to my people. What can I do here in this town to feel connected to my people? Mm. This is a study that's fascinating. I, of course, being a Chabad, I said, get a pair of tefillin. You'll put them on every morning. You'll feel wrapped up with your people. Mm-hmm. You'll feel tied up, tied, you know, tied in. You'll feel connected to your people. Mm-hmm. He says, oh, no, I can't do that. Every time I try to do something Jewish, I've had a bad experience. <laughs> I didn't pursue that. Like, what, every time you ate something kosher, you choke? I don't understand what that means. Every time I did something Jewish, it's been a bad experience. <laughs> but instead, I said to him, you know, nobody is Jewish because it's been a good experience. <laughs> it's not about a good experience. Is that the truth? It's about... God's need. God needs you to do certain things. You do it. He says, God needs? I never heard that before. And, oh, he also said, I, I won't tell you my name. What? Yeah. Because, anyway, this guy is a real study, right? I mean, wow. every, every word that comes out of his mouth is a whole new wow. psychological drama. <laughs> He says, God, geez, I've never heard of that. And I'm, I'm losing patience. Mm-hmm. He wants advice. I give him advice. No, he can't do that. So I tell him something. No, he disagrees. This guy's got problems. <laughs> so I said to him, look, is God all powerful and, and, and almighty? He says, yes. I said, God is perfect in every way? I said, yes. He knows everything? Yes. He is all powerful. He can do anything? Yes. I said, then, then he must also be infinitely vulnerable. Mm. Mm. He starts to laugh. God is vulnerable. God is almighty. So being a retired psychiatrist, I said to him, doctor, are you suggesting that being vulnerable is a weakness? He got completely flustered. Wow. And he hung up the phone. Thank you. I thought that was weird. (laughs) A few days later, he calls back. He says, hi, I'm calling from a little town in Oregon. I don't want to give you my name. (laughs) Where do I get to him? (laughs) So I figured, okay, I'm going to give him a hard time. I said, why all of a sudden? This is really amazing. He says, because my profession uh, doesn't doesn't allow me to accept the Christian message. I said, after 30 years? He says, let me explain this to you. In our profession, we know that if a man says to a woman, for example... I love you very, very much, more than anything in the world. Oh, you're not interested? You're lost. In other words, he's not vulnerable. If he feels that way, then his claim of love is false. He does not love her. It's not love, it's manipulation. Hmm. Wow. The message in Christianity is God loves you very, very much. Oh, you're not interested? <laughs> Go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> Forever. Literally. 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 Yeah. Yeah. In other words, no loss for him. No. Then he does not love you. So what does vulnerability mean? 
It's a godly trait. God is vulnerable, and we try to mimic him. Mm. It has nothing to do with weakness, with getting hurt, with, with being damaged or crippled. <laughs> vulnerable means if I care about you, it's because I need you. There's nothing more vulnerable than that. And what do I need you for? For you. Just to have you, because me by myself is not enough. So everything God asks us to do, we don't need to do. Stop a guy in the street and I say, come, you want to put on film? He says, I don't need that. I say, great, come, let's put him on. <laughs> if you need it, I'm sure you'll take care of it yourself. You don't need my help. But you don't need it. So you might not do it. So here's the filling. Do this because God needs it. We need to become better at things we don't need. Like being good for nothing. Mm. But we have to be convinced that God is infinitely vulnerable, not less vulnerable than us. Because if, if vulnerability is a strength, well, we're not stronger than him. So if we have the strength of vulnerability, he has it infinitely. So we're serving God literally. Like some guy says to me, I would not serve God if he weren't perfect. I said, wait a minute, if he's perfect, then you can't serve him. Wow. Because <laughs> he doesn't need you. Right. When we say serve God, we mean do for him something he needs infinitely. It's scary. It's like foreign. You, it's foreign. Yes. It's foreign for an egocentric human. That's going back to when I find out that my mother needs me, that's scary. Yeah. Because yeah. I need her for a couple of bucks, you know, and <laughs> to be in the will. <laughs> but, but she needs me? No. That's scary. Because she's old and mature. <laughs> Why would she need me? So it's the biggest compliment in the world, like the little girl who uh, thinks God is angry at her. Yes, God is angry at you, because he's vulnerable. If you don't keep Shabbos with him, he's like a religious guy whose family doesn't want to join him. So we're turning the world upside down. Free choice consists of making the decision. You can either be needy or needed. That's the difference between secular and spiritual, between mundane and holy. Everything needy is human and finite and depressing, <laughs> restricting, and everything holy and noble is being needed. Mm. It's such a relief. One, one more thing? Sure. Imagine, just a little uh, anecdote. <clears throat> Imagine a mother asks her son to make her tea every day, three times a day. Like Shachris, Mincha, Mariv. And he does. Three times a day, every day, he brings his mother tea for 50 years. At the end of 50 years, he discovers that his mother never drinks tea. She doesn't <laughs> like it. She doesn't drink it. She doesn't care for it. So he says to her, what was this? What was that all about? She says, tea doesn't mean anything. That's trivial. That's mm -hmm. petty. I wanted to give you the opportunity to get closer to me. Wow. Hmm. 
bad mother. Very bad mother. <laughs> Imagine if he finds out that his older brother was asked to bring his mother coffee, and his mother lives on coffee. Aha! Uh -huh. The plot thickens. So the other brother is bringing the mother what she needs and what she lives on, and he's bringing his mother something she doesn't need, doesn't use, and doesn't care for. He hasn't gotten closer to her. She has kept him out of her life. She's distanced him. That's like some guy's annoying you and you want to get rid of him. He said, can you do me a favor? Run around the corner. <laughs> See if it's raining. By asking him to bring tea, she kept him out of her life. That's closeness? So what is closeness? I want to be close to you. What does that mean? It means that I have discovered that there is something close to your heart that I'm not included in. And I'm jealous. I want that closeness. If I am the closest thing to your heart, then, then there's no more close. Then I'm not missing anything. So if I want to get closer to you, I have to know that there is closer. In addition to that, you have to invite me. Otherwise, I'm just a stalker. So if you tell me, you know, I just built a new house. It is unbelievable. It's the dream house. I've always, it is the, the biggest pleasure in my life. I love that house. And I'm waiting. Like, uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to enjoy it very much. I think, I'm not invited? All that and no invitation? Well, then that's it. I'm left out. I can't get closer. When God came down to Mount Sinai, he said, there are things that are so precious to me, and I want you to join me. Shabbat is my holy day. Keep it with me. I love mitzvahs love them with me. I hate sin, hate them with me. So he's revealing his soul, his loves, his hates, his agonies, his ecstasies, and he invites us in. That's closeness. So if you want to understand mitzvahs, mitzvahs are coffee, not tea. People get confused because if a son brings his mother tea three times a day for 50 years, are you not impressed? Yes, it's impressive. It's not closeness. It's obedience. They're not the same. You obey those you can't get close to. You obey a king, a principal in school, because you'll never get close. But a mitzvah is supposed to bring you close. The only way that happens is if the mitzvah gives God infinite pleasure and he wants to share it with you. Do I still need to eat? Who cares? So if I do eat, it's because he created me this way. So I'm doing everything for a heavenly purpose. Because there's no other way. I can't eat for any other reason. There is no other reason. So all of a sudden, life is sacred. Not because I'm noble or high-minded or spiritual. No, I just realized eating is not a human activity. It's a divine mishigas. <laughs> It's an inexplic inexplicable thing that God has that you, you should eat. And you should be intimate. Why? Because I need it.
So everything we do ends up being following God's script. God said, you're going to sleep part of your day, you're going to eat three times a day, you're going to be intimate with your... It's his script. I'm just trying to follow it carefully. It is so liberating. It's so healthy and so noble. So the two parts of it is, I need nothing. He needs everything. So I am not needy. I am needed. When God came to the Jewish people and said, I have a Torah, I have mitzvahs, are you interested? They said, yeah. What else is there to do? Because they already had no needs. And that's what it means, the first commandment. God says, I am God, your God, and I took you out of Egypt. You know what that means? That the Kabbalah behind that? I took you out of Egypt. Your needs are covered. Now you want to hear mine? And since then, we have no needs. We've outgrown needs. I took you out of Egypt. Done. Now listen to what I need. That's Judaism. And that's the only thing that's going to save the world. We have to spread this message to the world. Stop being needy and demanding things from God and start serving Him. That's why we're here. It's not just a good idea. It's the idea. The idea. <laughs> it's not a purpose. It's the purpose. Mm. with the answer you gave the 12 you I mean when you told me how you answered her it was like how did you come up with that it's absolutely incredible uh, I have a big dilemma about I want to go back to Shabbat I I am nowhere close to keeping the Shabbat the correct way but uh, since I know I am not capable of that yet, I promised myself that I will take step by step, baby step. So, so far what I do is um, I don't go on the phone, I don't answer phone calls, which gives me a lot of free time. I'm not on the phone, my ear is resting, it's a big, big difference in my life. I don't light uh, any fires, I don't cook, I, uh, but the free time, the brain goes in places it's not supposed to go. I usually during the day keep myself very, very busy. I'm a busy body, I don't sit idle, so I don't have a lot of time for that. Why is it that on Shabbat, it becomes so active and not good thoughts, it's all bad. What's going on? Help me with that, please. Not your problem? <laughs> not your problem? <laughs> I have my, my answers, but they're not going to be anything compared to yours. <laughs> Probably be more practical. <laughs> I mean, this was part of what we discussed in our in our promo video, where I believe you know we know that that Shabbat during Shabbat we're given an extra soul, an extra holy soul for those twenty four hours. What I have seen is that this is not a this is a very common thing where that extra soul comes in our human conception of that soul or, or relationship with that soul <coughs> moves into a place of wanting to create. We are given a little bit extra drive, we're given a, a little bit extra premonition, intuition, uh, 
you know, motivation and rather than having the discipline to drive that into a place of holiness, because that's not our practice, we are seeking to drive that into a place of productivity, which is what most people in modern day seek to achieve. We, we, we want to sort of get our dopamine receptors going, you know, um, because we don't have the practice of daily holiness. Whereas I think that if you practice Shabbat correctly, it is not a day, it's not on that day. It is a practice that begins on the first day of the week where you're prepping for Shabbat. You are um, practicing three times a day meditative, holy practices that are in Judaism not sitting in meditation, but actual act or active praying. All of these things, all of the, the preparations for Shabbat prep you so that once you get to Shabbat, you are enjoying the fruits of Shabbat. But if you are not prepping for Shabbat all week and you are not engaged in any kind of spiritual activity all week, then when you get to Shabbat, there is a conflict. The way that I'll, I explain it is that there's a conflict between that Extern, you know, excess holy soul, that excess holiness, and that part of you that still seeks to be served through your productivity. That ego satiation that you get every time you produce, every time you get on the phone and you get that, you, you help somebody or you do something that gives you that ego satiation, you're not doing any of that. You're not producing, you're not creating. And so there's a conflict and that conflict rises on Shabbats. But if you had the daily practice I, I, and you did Shabbat correctly, that's my cue to turn it over to the rabbi. <laughs> Thank you, my love. The feeling of Shabbat experience of Shabbat in one word is contentment. Mapsut. On Shabbos you're supposed to feel content. Whatever you did during the week it was good. If you read in the Torah in the description of creation God created light and he said it was good. On the third day, he created trees, and he said it was good. And each day, he said it was good, because by the time you get to Shabbos, it's perfect. So you don't do any labor on Shabbat, because you don't need it. It's good. Now, <clears throat> contentment is a foreign experience. <laughs> we, never, we never practice contentment. In fact, if you feel content, you feel guilty. You're sitting around doing nothing. That's a terribly masculine impulse. The male impulse is to constantly be creating and changing and fixing. The female is much better at contentment. Somebody once said, you see it in the language. A man and a woman get married. The, girl, the woman calls all her friends. Guess what? I'm married. The man calls all his friends and says, Guess what? I got married. <laughs> Men don't understand women because you're content and they can't figure out why. <laughs> Women have a capacity to be content, which is why they're good nurturers. Because if you're not content, then, then you're preoccupied, you can't nurture others. To really be present with a baby, no man can do that. Mm. He's holding the baby and it's delicious and it's wonderful. And he's thinking, how am I going to pay for the college? <laughs> and the baby feels the stress. <laughs> and starts to cry. Yeah, how are you going to pay for the car? 
So Shabbos is the practice of contentment. And it'll take some practice. But this is what you're looking for. You're looking for that relief, that deep breath where you can just let go. It's good. You think about your grandparents. Their week was misery. Miserable. How did they survive that life? Shabbat. Because when Shabbat came, they were king and queen. Content, life is wonderful. We have a piece of bread with a piece of herring. We're at top of the world. During the week, they worked hard to you know, change or fix whatever they could. But when it comes to Shabbat, I got no needs. I'm fine. It's wonderful. Life is great. You practice it, you get good at it. And then I Shabbos... I am content, which I feel I am. I, Baruch Hashem. Well, then you don't need to run around to do something. Right? What am I going to do with this? <laughs> right, so, so the advice is you learn to do Shabbos stuff. You read, you learn, sleep a little more, but feel the contentment, otherwise you're driven. We're, we're, we're trained to be driven. Don't waste time, be productive. What are you doing? During the week, that's great. On Shabbat, if God can relax <laughs> on Shabbat, we should be able to do it too because it's not my world. I don't have to worry about everything. So I have the question of my life regarding Shabbat, which is I've discussed it with some other wise people, but when I come home, at the time I think they answered my question, and then I come home and think about it, and I'm like... And that is that it is a mitzvah for a husband and wife to be intimate together. Aren't they creating the biggest creation in the universe where they are intimate together, where Shabbat is the only time we cannot create? No, well, that's if the baby would be born that day, you would have created a baby. <laughs> but it doesn't happen that day. So when the woman conceives, that, that is not, uh, it's not a living being yet? What's it's not on? creation. What is it? It's life. It's a continuation of life. So aren't they creating a life? No, you don't create life. Only God can create life. So God is creating life. We continue life. Like, you know, the old question with the abortion issue, when does life begin? Hey, life doesn't begin, it continues. You can't begin a life. You can't go from not alive to alive. It starts when the sperm and the egg are conceived. That's when the life begins, yes. isn't it? No, that's when it continues. The same way that the same way that I would say when you uh, pass on, you are not. It's not the end of existence for a soul. You are continuing. It's nothing spiritual. It's just a biological process. You eat, and you digest the food. It's not called creating. It's being a living being. That is a an automatic thing that happens. Yes. Eating and automatically is digest. Uh, yeah, Pre pregnancy is also automatic. <laughs> See that? I cannot <laughs> My sabra mother is not going to let this go until it makes logical sense for her. She's very logically oriented. Bless her. I'm sorry, but this is one thing. <laughs> See, everything else you explained made complete sense to me. But what, why is getting pregnant any... Why is getting pregnant any different from gaining weight? <laughs> That's very different. Why? Gaining weight with a life being created is you're comparing them together? Yeah. 
It's a you biological can say, process. You can say you're creating extra fat cells, but but are you? But that's gaining weight. Okay, so there you go, and it's the same soul that has been in existence coming into its next stage of evolution. It's not a creation. Well, the soul is certainly not a creation. Are you creating a body? It's the beginning of that, isn't it? It is. It is, but creating a body is a biological process. It's not something new or foreign. It's a continuation of life. Cells reproduce. Life goes on. The mitzvah is not to have babies. The mitzvah is to be intimate. So even if you're not having a baby, sometimes. Yeah, it's a continuation. But, but again, the intimacy is what's important, even if you're not going to have a baby. Okay, there's, there's, there's one other thing. One other thing. We're, we're not good at time. Handling time. Free time makes us crazy. I don't know why, but... You know, during vacation time, more people get killed, more people get into accidents, more people commit suicide, because they have free time. Why are we so afraid of free time? We feel guilty? I'm not doing anything. I'm going to get criticized for not doing anything. Because we're so programmed to, to produce and to... So, we have to learn how to be productive spiritually. Learning, reading, that's the main thing. For Shabbat. Shabbat tells you, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough. What do you tell that little voice? That's never happened to me. I get up, I go to synagogue, I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, like around two in the afternoon, and then I fall yeah. yeah. But you know that you're not allowed to apologize for your sins on Shabbat? Oh, we are not. Really. Because apologizing for your sins is correcting the, the mistakes or the fixing the problem. No fixing, no correcting. Everything is good. And I thought that's the holiest of the holy <laughs> for things like that. So again, for me, I feel like this is, this is more of a, I mean, everything emanates from the spiritual, but it's a psychological battle where your entire life you're going to be battling your yourself you know two two parts or more for some people of your mind are battling each other and to me shabbat is a culmination of your week of practice of spiritual practice and if you jump into shabbat without preparation it's virtually impossible to do it correctly if you haven't set up the light so that you can read right i think rabbi i think for you you you're you're coming from a place where it's it's like you can't even conceptualize the the practicalities of some of a secular person who cooking before shabbat so that all you're doing is enjoy just going to you know you're just like picking food off your hot plate you're setting things up for, you know, it took me 10 years of living with an, with an observant man to not have constant, like, oh, it's, it's Shabbat. Oh, we can't do that today. Cause it's, I mean, 10 years, 10 years of, of being trained to, to understand, like, it's Shabbat. He can't do it. He, you, I can't do it. it can't, you know, that's a long time. That's practice. And it's, and, and then, and then the second 10 years was 
you got to prep for Shabbat. You got to prep for the holidays. You don't arrive at at Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur and go, okay, okay, we're we're fasting today. You you prep for it from a month ahead of time. You lower your caffeine intake. You prep. You know, you you've heard me say all of these things. You you start eating a little less. You start thinking about the things you want to pray for, and then you have this incredible spiritual experience on the day. Same with Shabbat. It's a pra- it's a daily practice of spiritual practice where you're taking, you know, I mean, Judaism says three times a day you're you're doing the Amidah, you're doing the prayers, you're you're taking time out of your day for 10 15 minutes to move into a meditative spiritual practice. That's one step. Then you're prepping challah the day before. You're prepping food prior. You're inviting people prior. You're you're do you're setting yourself up for what am I going to read? What am I going to do? I think the problem is I used to live in San Francisco, away from community, like eight miles away from kosher shuls, like Orthodox shul, and no friends around. So. Shabbat was like boring, boring. But the problem is when you have people mm, around you, community. you know, are you right preparing Shabbat, shopping, starting from Wednesday, Shabbat is coming That's to right. go through to Friday, and then you're ready for the day. These things, you have to have people around you to be able to have someone come, mm. to be able to go to the shul and to be able to come with someone in the shul. Like, my house right now is like a hotel or Shabbat. No. Everybody comes, everybody goes, everybody comes. How nice. But you have to be around the people. Right. So that's why it's so important. It's so important to be in the community area. Mm. Shul is here. We need to be around mm. them. If you go away, it's not easy. Absolutely. You have to be around them. So when you buy a house, oh, is that close to the shul? Is that close to the people? Mm. This is, I guess, it's so important. Very. Community is is an essential element, absolutely. But I would also say, as a psychologist, I would say, <laughs> I would say, listen to those voices that come up and are battling you on Shabbat. I would say, take note. What are those? What are those inner demons that are presenting themselves? You know, listen. Maybe those are things that you need to work on during the week, and they're things that you. You are numbing yourself or distracting yourself from listening to that need to be heard. They need to be processed. They need to be worked on. And, and you know, well, no, healed, healed, healed. Can I say something is Shabbat. Everybody, I met one priest, he knew many, many things in Torah. But he could not keep Shabbat. Every person that wants to be Jewish has to keep Shabbat because every person that can stand should have an independence. In, in Iranian said one of the independence of the Judaism is Shabbat. But if you go to Shabbat, you don't need it in it. Rashid started with Shabbat. You know, combine it the word of Rashid is Shabbat. And God, Hashem, created this world. To the end of this world, we come to the Shabbat. And when Mashiach comes, everybody is in Shabbat. Mm-hmm. If you want to get Real, real uh, relaxations. Do not go to any family therapist or to anywhere. Go to Shabbat. When you go to Shabbat, you connect it to Gan Eden. You connect it to Hashem. That you are so much precious that Hashem invited you. To be with me. Look at that you love somebody and is counting, counting that he is invited you. 
And when Hashem can't help, come, come, with, stay with me. You don't need anything. You are my guest. You are my best guest. If you are gonna taste it, taste it, those things, you are not gonna leave the Shabbat. Thank you. Thank you. Erica. Uh, thank you so much for this. First of all, I'm really enjoying it. My mind's kind of exploding, so I'm going to try to summarize this. Um, I think one of my constant psychological obsessions is um, what, what to do with my life. Um, and I'm, what I'm hearing is that the purpose is to serve Hashem and through mitzvot. But I, I guess I wonder, outside of that, does anything else matter? Like, if I have a drive to create in this world um, beyond, you know, uh, taking part in having children, beyond that, that gift, creating, you know, something that serves others in some way or serves God in some way, I think I often obsess about what exactly does that look like, and I don't want to do the wrong thing, or I want to do it perfectly. Um, and so I'm just curious if that even matters, the, the passions we have or the things that we actually create, the, the material things in this world, does that matter outside of this world? Even eating lunch matters. It's all godly. So if God gave you a need to eat, it's a godly thing. If God gave you a talent, it's certainly a godly thing. Nobody gets talents for nothing. You're given a talent because God needs you to use that talent to the best of your ability. And through that, you make the world a more livable place so that God can be comfortable in his world. So if you add beauty to the world, that's fantastic, godly. You add joy and laughter to the world, it's godly. The sages say that a, a person, a comedian, who makes other people laugh have a special place in heaven. Which means, which means that there's a sense of humor in heaven. Otherwise it would be torture for comedians <laughs> to sit in heaven where nobody laughs. So, let me take it one step further. God runs the world so perfectly that every detail counts, including which sin are you tempted to commit? Why are you tempted to commit one kind of sin and your neighbor wants to commit some other kind of sin? It's all by divine plan. God needs you to handle this temptation he needs somebody else to handle a different temptation. That is so amazing. Even my weakness is a divine plan. This is the evil that you have to say no to, not the others. So a person says, I'm not a bad person, I'm, I'm good, I don't kill anybody. You have no temptation to kill, that's not your job. So why does one person have a temptation to steal, the other person has a temptation to commit adultery? It's not an accident, and it's not you doing it. Isn't that amazing? So, why do I have this temptation? Because that's the temptation that God wants you to fix. It's not an accident, it's not your fault, it's not, it's not, you're not doomed. This is your job. Do it. If that's true of sin, it's certainly true of talents. So if you have a talent, use it because God gave it to you and you should not waste it. If you can get rich, do it. If you can be funny, do it. Anything that makes the world more inhabitable. And that's true of non-Jews also. We all have to make the world a better place. In every way, in every detail. I was speaking to the police department here in, in L.A. You know, when the whole thing with defunding the police. Mm -hmm. 
And they took it very seriously. There's a Jewish lieutenant in the police department. And he called. He wanted to talk about, you know, well, what's happening? What are we supposed to do? So he says uh, something like, uh, do we have the right to enforce the law? I said, no. You don't have a right. You have a divine uh, commandment, an obligation to enforce the law. It's not your right. You have no, you have no rights to tell people what to do. If you serve as a policeman, you're doing God's work. That's not a right, that's an obligation. So a policeman doing his job properly is serving God because he's making life livable. Whatever it is that makes life safer, more comfortable, more doable, more enjoyable, and more inspiring, that's God's work. So yes, every talent, every ability you have, it's holy. I just have a philosophical question. Why, why do we have so many wrong-headed Jews in this world who are not making this world a better place by doing the opposite? Self-hated Jews. Sorry, what's hmm? the question? Self-hated Jews. Hmm. Actually, Jews, more than anyone in the world, are making this place a better place. The only problem is, most Jews are doing what non-Jews are supposed to be doing, and taking away their jobs. We make the best music, we we invent the best machines, We're, like in Israel now, the technology. That's not our job, but we we're so driven to make contributions, we'll even make the wrong contribution. But we win the Nobel Prize. What is all that? That's all making the world better. But God is saying, I have 8 billion people doing that. That's not what I need from you. From you I need to make the world better Jewish. It's, it's a... We're, we're, we're learning the lesson slowly. Well, I'm not happy with the Jews. Hold it up. That is so Jewish. <laughs> it's also extremely important to not identify Judaism with the Jews that may be misrepresenting the faith. And that's one of the primary mistakes most Jews make. They throw the baby away with the bathwater, which means they will find Jews that present themselves or um, translate for themselves the Torah in a way that is not by the book, and they will immediately decide that that is what Judaism is. And so they will actually divorce themselves from Judaism and some go as far as divorcing themselves from their own creator because of what they see humans represent. That is a deeply, um, it's a treacherous mistake because you are shooting yourself in the foot because you may not like your fellow Jew or come across a fellow Jew and then you associate that with Torah has nothing to do with Torah. Torah didn't tell this person to, you know, represent the Torah in that way or behave in these ways. So that's something that unfortunately a lot of Persian Jews, especially in this city, do. Because we were thrown into a situation where most of our parents had to leave a country they had spent their entire lives building their life, building their fortune, making their money, and they had to come out in middle age, which is not an easy thing to do, and start over again in a country that was like dog eat dog. Capitalistic country that was not an easy place to start over. So some people went for the jugular, they, they, which means they, they would step on anyone, do anything, get, you know, to feed their families. 
to build their fortunes. It stuck with some people, and some people came full circle and adjusted with the second generation that's being born. None of that actually has anything to do with Judaism. None of it. You'll, you'll find a lot of Persian Jews who will say, this rabbi, that rabbi, they did this, they did that, that was unethical. I'm turning my back on Judaism. That has nothing to do with Judaism. Nothing. No, I'm, not, I'm not turning my back, I'm just saying. No, I know you're not. I know you're not. I know what I'm saying is that a lot of people in our culture, a lot of people who live in this city do. I know, I, I'm not saying you are. I'm saying a lot of people do. They turn their back and it's because of the representations of Torah by people who have you know, maybe not done a great job. So uh, uh, what I'm saying and what I tell everyone all the time is go back to the source, go back to your Torah. It belongs to you, okay? Discover, do your own research, find your own path, find your own rabbi who is somebody who speaks to your soul and realign yourself with your own spirituality that is not, divorce yourself from other people who don't align with your values. Don't divorce yourself from your own lineage. This is your lineage. That's what I, I would say to that. Uh, uh, on a talk show on the radio, somebody asked the other guest, how come Jews don't write music anymore? And he said, they don't write Jewish music. But who do you think wrote, I'm dreaming of a right Christmas? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or Jingle Bells. Jews created modern Christmas. Yes. So we're, we're big contributors. <laughs> but we should contribute a little more Jewishly. That would be, that would be our special gift to the world. When Moshe comes, all Jews come back, or only the Tadidim? All Jews? All Jews. Every Jew. Two part question. Um, first, is it accurate to say that everything that happens is in accordance with God's plan? And second, is it accurate to say that God is conscious, it knows everything that has happened is happening and will happen? So, in a sense, everything's already happened. Okay, three part. So, <laughs> so that, because I see you nodding. If that's correct, in a sense, we're stepping through life with the sense that we have free will, making decisions here and there. It's all part of God's greater plan, and it'll happen as it happens. Um, but are we just sort of walking through something that's that God has already created? If that makes any sense. That, that is partly true. We're living out the plan that is already planned. But I think a good example would be the whole world or all humanity is on a huge ship. And this ship is heading to Jerusalem. So it's going east. But there are people on the ship who are walking on the ship towards the west and they think they're going to the west are they like you're asking will every Jew come back every Jew is going in the right direction some don't know it so the guys who are walking in, on the deck of the ship they're walking to the west where are they going they're going to the east because the ship is going to the east what the Torah tells us is, turn around. <laughs> You're facing the wrong way. You're not enjoying the journey. You think you're going... No. You're... So God's plan continues, and the ship goes in the right direction. We have to be concerned and have a little compassion for people who don't know where they're going. So a Jew says, no, nah, I quit. I'm not going to be Jewish anymore. Yeah, you are. Because <laughs> the ship only goes one way. 
So why can't you enjoy the journey? Don't get there in spite, despite yourself. Get there because of yourself. So God says, look, it's all going to end up good anyway. But why do you want it to end up good despite you? Be part of it. Join me in this vast eternal plan. Be, be a partner, not an accident. So we're all going to end up in the right place because God's plan can't fail. But the, the personal feelings that God has for every Jew, like we were saying before about face to face or back to back, back to back, God is going to schlep you off to Jerusalem anyway. <laughs> but why does he have to schlep you? Turn around. Look where you're going, see where you're going, understand where you're going, and you'll enjoy it a lot more. But we're all going in the right direction. So what happens when you go to the east and it's going to the west? May I speak to what? this? May I speak to this? Sure. My question was, I'm sorry. Um, what happens when the ship gets to the east and it's going to the west? I don't understand it. Not going to happen. Once we get to where we're going, everyone will understand. They, get, they all get up the sheep. And love it. This, this was one of the, the questions that created the most existential angst for me <laughs> as a teenager and growing up. And so I, I feel like I spent a good portion of my life trying to find the answer to this, the nuances of it. And I'd love to sort of have your input on it and what I understood is that there is a finite number of potential destinies that any human being has depending on their free will from one year to another year okay so if you imagine a, a ladder okay um, and between every rung Right. Each, each rung is a year of your life, and between every rung, there is a finite number of potential destinies. And based on your free will, you can make a choice this way or a choice that way at every single second of your life. So you can take the high road when you're you know, presented with an issue, or you can take the low road. And each one of those choices you make within those two rungs will qualify you for the higher level of your destiny. I mean, the ultimate is that, but from the year to year, it's where you're locked into the following Rosh Hashanah, you're locked into now you, 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 you've earned this level of potential destinies where your free will will lock you into, or you've kind of denigrated yourself a little bit so for me, that was important to know. It was important to know that you, the more you learn and your, your, your free will has, there are, you know, everything Hashem knows and at the end of the day and at the end of your life, you end up where you're meant to go. But the journey can be one that is pleasant and beneficial and uplifting and, um, can serve you in, in a way that you can enjoy your life in a different way, or you're going to keep getting a wrecking ball to your life to try to wake you up to the potential you have to spiritually evolve. And that's where your free will comes into play. So your decisions at a minute to minute basis do make a difference within this finite level of different destinies that are the potential. Um, so you are working, you know, hand in hand with Hashem's plan for you, but at the end of your life, you know, you're on that ship and you're going to end up at the destination that you're meant to end up at. Is that, would that be a correct way of kind of explaining? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean by turning around. Mm. You're going, you're going to end up anyway. Turn around, enjoy right. the trip. Gotcha. Be part of it instead of... Gotcha. But why do we have free choice? Why should we have free choice? 
We make bad choices. For 20 years. They so why would God give us free choice? Make all the decisions for us and we're much better off. And we better let him make the choice. Right. <laughs> that sounds nice. We have free choice only where we must. God gives us free choice only where he has to. Where does he have to give us free choice? He has to let me choose which house to buy? Let him choose it, it'll be better. Which job to take? Who to marry? Let him choose it. There's only one thing he cannot choose and that is whether I love him. If he wants me to love him, he has to give me freedom of choice. Why? Because if he makes me love him, I don't love him. So the only area in which we really need free choice is how we react to him. Love him, fear him, hate him, because he wants a real religion. And that's why being an angel is not real. It's not, an angel doesn't love God. He's programmed. It's a clone. So where do we really have free choice? Only in our reaction to him. And the rest of it, we don't need free choice and we shouldn't have it. God chooses where you're going to live, who you're going to marry, what talents you're going to have, even what temptations you're going to have. The only thing you have to choose, and he cannot choose for you, is your love. Because he really wants you to love him. Not he should love himself. By making us love him, then he's loving himself. So when we talk about free choice, it really is limited. We don't have that, like somebody, somebody said, I can marry whoever I want. Wow, that's impressive. Because <laughs> there are about three billion men in the world and you can marry any one of them. Wow. Well, actually, you're not going to need three billion men. So let's reduce it down to reality. You're going to need 20 men. Of those 20 men, 19 of them don't want to marry you. <laughs> so what just happened to your great freedom of choice? There's one guy who wants to marry you. You're going to say yes or no, that's it. <laughs> we don't have that much freedom of choice. It's like, which pair of shoes are you going to buy when you go into the shoe store? You can choose? No, you can't choose. Certain colors you just don't like. You have no choice. And you can only buy the ones that are coming your size. So we're so programmed with all sorts of... Right? You have the freedom to choose between vanilla and chocolate? No, you happen to like chocolate. And it wasn't your choice. So where do we have free choice? Only in our response to God. But our response to God can take many different forms, right? It could take the form of how I respond to temptation or how I react to my husband, or right? You can react in a godly way or not in a godly way. If I love God, I want to behave in ways that conform with having a good relationships and a good life. So you're so either paying attention to him or you're ignoring him. Mm -hmm. There you have freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. But in the many different aspects of life. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the analogy with the boat, even if you make all the wrong choices, you're going to end up his. And he will be yours. Always. Because he'll never give up on you. Which one hurts the most? Hurting Hashem or hurting Hashem? 
Hashem. Hurting another Jew. Just like a father. He'd mother, much rather get hurt himself than see his kid hurt. Rabbi, your brilliance is reaching the masses. My lowly state is going into the, the nuances. So if, you, if your choices are erring on the side of not the higher level choices, and you culminate at the end of your life with having made the lesser choice rather than the better choice, the place that you attain in the world to come is a lower place rather than a higher place. And with that comes discomfort rather than pleasure, right? Isn't that an important thing for people to know? Because it's a motive, because again, we, 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 we're egocentric and, and not to, you know, I know that all of Christianity revolves around that, like the fear of hell and all that. We, we're not like that, but it's important to know that you're, that you are, we're not all just purely ending up at the same place, but that when you're making those positive choices, you're doing those extra mitzvah, if you're doing, you know, it, you are ending up in a higher, more pleasurable, beneficial state. Heaven. Heaven. That's temporary. It's all part of the process. The ship is still moving. Mm. Heaven is part of the ship. Mm -hmm. You come, you go, you come back, you go to hell, you go, you, you get out of there. You, it's all, it's all the process. It'll all end up in the right place. Mm. The beauty of it. The question about God already knows. So where do we get our freedom of choice? The question exists because we have an assumption. First, God makes a plan, written in stone, and then tells you that you have freedom of choice. Doesn't make sense. But it doesn't happen that way. God doesn't make a plan until after you made a choice. Wow. So divine providence, the entire plan that God has, is built around your choice. Wow. That's, that's how a relationship should be. Mm. A husband takes responsibility for the welfare of the family, which means whatever the wife chooses, he will make it work. Mm. Not he decides what the wife is going to do in advance. Or the children. You let your children be who they are, but make a plan around that so that it all turns out good. Wow. So God's commitment to us and his humility, he lets us make our choices first, then he makes it. Hmm. So if you want to go to the right, God has to make a plan of what's going to happen on the right. You choose to go to the left, God has to make a plan for the left. Hmm. There is so much romance because our relationship to God is the ultimate, um, the ultimate mold for all relations. The way you relate to God is how you relate to your spouse. The way you relate to your spouse is how you're going to relate to God. Tonight, uh, I was under the impression that which is what I heard was that, for example, when God asks us to observe Shabbat, it's not that He doesn't really care if we observe Shabbat, He doesn't do anything to Him. It's for us to, you know, because it's proven that all these the Shabbat, all the high holidays, it's all about family getting together. Family bond, when you have that, you have a better foundation for life. So 
it's actually it's for our benefit, not him. But what you're saying is the opposite of that. We all do it because of his needs, not because of our needs. So it's like the complete opposite of what I've been hearing. Yes. Yes. But let's take it a step further. Let's say God gave us the Shabbat so that we would have a day off to spend with our family. Michael. What does he care? He, he just changed what he cares about. First, you thought he cares about Shabbat. No, he cares about family. Right. Why does he care about family? It's important to him that you should have a happy family. Okay. If that's what he wants, let's give him a let's give him a happy family. It's easier to keep Shabbat. <laughs> but it's his commandment. What do we? How do we understand that? Why is God says honor your father and mother? What does he care what I do with my father and mother? In other words, how does it affect him? What's he mixing in? He's just giving me good advice? Well, I thought that's what it was. Like you're saying. Just good advice. Yeah. The problem with that is, I'm giving you good advice, and if you don't take my advice, I'm going to punish you, and you're going to come. Then it's not advice. Right. It's more important to God that you honor your parents than it is to your parents. Mm. I think you're getting the point. God is vulnerable. God needs. God invested everything himself into his creation. And we turn around and say, well, I need some more of this. I need some more of that. So not nice. So even a person who says, I need to be a good Jew, stop it. You don't need to be a good Jew. I need to be a good husband. No, you don't. Your wife needs a little attention. Stop being a good husband and take care of her. That's a relationship. I'm going to be a good mother. Oh yeah, you're going to kill your kids. Don't be a good mother. Just take care of the kids. Because it's about them, not about you. So in marriage counseling, this guy says to me, I'm, I read some book, I figured it out. I know how to be a good husband. I'm going to do it. I said, oh, your poor wife. <laughs> She's going to pay for this. You decided to be a good husband. It's going to be at her expense. Don't be a good husband. Think about your wife once in a while. Will that make you a good husband? Irrelevant. If you do 613 mitzvot, will you be a good Jew? Irrelevant. Who asked you to be good? Think about what God needs and help out. Pitch in. That's why the woman said, you said, you're going to keep Shabbat one little step at a time. Is that, is that good? Does that make you a Shomer Shabbat? No, you're not a Shomer Shabbat. But you're doing what you can for God. So if you don't shop on Shabbos, God appreciates it. Because you're doing it for Him. You don't answer the phone on Shabbat? It's so precious. Does it make you a Shomer Shabbos? No. You read a few Jewish books, does it make you a Talmud Chacha? No. Who asked you to be a Talmud Chacha? Learn Torah. Don't become. <laughs> There's a silly example. Somebody asked the Rebbe. She, she was looking for a job to make some money. And she said, would it be okay if I become a typist? back in the old days. The Rebbe said, make a living typing. Don't become a typist. Mm. 
Be a human being who types. <laughs> but don't become a typist. Take care of your children. Don't become a good mother. Think about your wife and husband once in a while. Don't become good at it. And don't be a good Jew. Whenever you can, think about God, what He needs. Will that get you to heaven? Probably not. <laughs> so all of this is moving a person out of the realm of the ego. Essentially, everything I'm hearing you say yeah. is... But the, but the beauty of it is, you're not giving up anything because you never needed it in the first place. Right. And counterintuitively, it's the ultimate form of evolving yourself. Ultimate. <laughs> Full circle, yeah. Full circle. Full circle, Full circle moment. One of the best things in our life is the appreciation. And when we appreciate, it is a satisfaction to all and we release. If God needs, so why do you appreciate? You appreciate to God. We are doing for God, for Hashem. So, so why we are appreciate? Appreciate what? If somebody, you know, in physically everything has a value, we with the dollar we appreciate and pay for this thing or for this jacket or for. And for Hashem, if all we are doing for Hashem and Hashem needs it. Why we are appreciated? This is one, and everybody has goals, and ultimate everybody wants to go to Gan Eden. If you are not going to experience it, experience Gan Eden here, how can you realize over the world, and why we are not going to bring Gan Eden over here? Every human being can do everything. Why? Only that you are, you are waiting to go <laughs> You're right. We are not supposed to get to Gan Eden. We're supposed to bring God down to earth from Gan Eden. So if you're going to Gan Eden, you're going to miss God because he's coming down and you're going up to an empty Gan Eden because God wants to be here. What do we appreciate? that he involves us in his plan. You're letting me be part of your plan? You're giving me a little credit for making the world better? Very grateful. That's in the brachot that we make. Thank you for giving me a mitzvah. Because you could do it yourself, but you're letting me do a little service for you. Mm. Grateful. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everybody, for staying so late. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there's a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs. And there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best. And join us for some enjoyable conversation.